um, treat uh, diseases uh, in the abdomen, uh, gastrointestinal, and that includes uh, hepatobiliary type tumors um, that uh, we're talking about today, uh, specifically bile duct and gallbladder uh, cancers. Now let me um, share my screen here. And uh, just to confirm, is it, do you guys see it in uh, presenter mode? We do. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, you know, I, I thought I would take a, a, a different view of, of, of uh, bile duct cancer and gallbladder cancer and, and, and present it in a way um, where um, it, we go through the questions that, that might come up. Uh, when you um, present to a doctor uh, with, with what you're being told is uh, bile duct cancer or gallbladder cancer. Um, you know, oftentimes that, that first visit is, is a, uh, a challenging one. There's a lot of information that is, is uh, presented to you and uh, it can oftentimes be uh, overwhelming. And so sometimes the, the hardest thing is to know uh, what to ask. Um, and, and so I'll be presenting um, about bile duct cancer, also called cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer in a, in a, in a way um, that, that, that you, you, you might uh, ask your doctor. Let's see here. So for, first off, what is bile duct or gallbladder cancer? Um, the uh, bile ducts, um, are a system of, of ducts that come from the liver. Uh, these, these are abdominal organs and, and the liver uh, does many things. It, it, uh, uh, it's important for metabolism. Uh, it's also important for uh, uh, digestion. Uh, bile is, is something that allows, it helps you to digest uh, uh, fatty foods. And on top of that, it helps to get rid of, of certain uh, chemicals that your, your body's trying to filter out. And as that bile comes through the liver, it comes through a bile duct right here. Part of that bile duct is outside of the liver, and then part of it goes through the pancreas. And that's that's will become important as, as we talk about um, uh, treatments and surgeries that, that uh, you might need for uh, this type of cancer. And then the, the gallbladder is essentially a storage tank of bile and it connects to the bile duct. Um, the uh, bile duct uh, is divided into to really th these three different areas, the intrahepatic or, or bile ducts within the liver, the perihyler or, or uh, a bile duct outside of the liver, and then the distal bile duct or the bile duct uh, within the, the pancreas. Um, what what do you need to know about gallbladder or bile duct cancer? Um, the, um, these, these are rare types of cancer. They really only in, encompass about two to 3% of the malignancies in the United States. Um, the, the numbers of bile duct cancers is about 2,500 per year and, of, and gallbladder cancers is, is 5,000 per year. So, so they're really not common. Um, and you know that makes it sometimes difficult um, because um, it, it's often uh, difficult to enroll patients in, in clinical trials and, and be able to to uh, discover uh, new treatments. And so and until recently, there there really were were very few treatments uh, because of 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 how rare uh, bile duct cancer is. Um, we really don't know why people get uh, these types of cancers. Um, there are some things that can predispose uh, you to, to uh, getting cancer, but for the large part, we, most people do not, have, do not know why they develop the cancer. Uh, some things that, that may increase your risk, something called sclerosing cholangitis, this is also rare and is a small part of already a small number of cancers. Uh, ulcerative colitis is an inflammatory bowel uh, disease. Um, 
and it increases the risk of, of, of bile duct cancers. Um, chronic inflammation of the gallbladder uh, can predispose, predispose you to gallbladder cancer. Um, there are uh, cysts within the bile ducts that, that can be precancerous and, and sometimes require resection um, even before there's cancer to uh, hopefully prevent, prevent developing cancer. And then uh, for certain parts of the world, uh, there are some infections, parasitic infections that can increase your risk of cancer. How do uh, bile duct and gallbladder cancers present? Oftentimes they will present with jaundice. And jaundice is when your skin becomes yellow. Um, it's due to blockage of the bile duct. Um, and the reason is that the bile no longer is able to flow uh, or drain and it builds up and, and uh, deposits in the skin. That can cause itching. It can cause a change in the color of stool or urine. Um, and uh, is, is often the presenting sign or symptom uh, uh, because the, the, these, these tumors often um, go, uh, are difficult to, to find or diagnose until they, they reach this point. Um, sometimes there can be abdominal pain. Sometimes if there's an infection uh, associated with the obstruction or tumor, there can be fevers. Um, oftentimes there is weight loss uh, or diarrhea. Are all bile duct obstructions cancer? And the answer to that is, is no. And uh, th this will become important uh, when we talk about uh, how we diagnose um, uh, these cancers. Oftentimes we don't diagnose them until after surgery. Um, so sometimes you may go into an operation um, and not know whether there's cancer or not. And it could be any one of these things. Um, one of the uh, more common causes of, of uh, bile duct obstruction is gallstones. But if there's no gallstones, then it's, it's unlikely that that is, is the cause of the obstruction. Uh, some more rare causes of, of obstruction are autoimmune inflammation, um, uh, something called IgG4 me mediated cholangitis or sclerosing cholangitis, which is associated with ulcerative colitis, what we had talked about before. Um, and even if these, uh, th this can potentially lead to cancer, but it also can just cause an obstruction in and of itself. Um, and then there are also um, bile duct or gallbladder adenomas. These are, are overgrowth of normal tissue. They can uh, over time turn into a cancer, but are, are not a cancer um, at, at, at this point. Um, how is uh, gallbladder cancer, bile, du bile duct cancer diagnosed. Um, most commonly, if there are symptoms, that will uh, uh, prompt imaging studies and laboratory studies. Uh, the, the images uh, performed can be CT scans, MRIs, or ultrasounds. Um, and these help us to, to see, ultrasounds are, are, are usually uh, to uh, determine whether there's gallstones, but if there's concerning findings, it will likely lead to an MRI or a CT scan, which give us pictures uh, of the abdomen and can help us to um, uh, see abnormalities within the liver or the bile duct. Um, labs can give us a clue of what's going on, but it, it's, it's really, it really doesn't give us a diagnosis. It just hints towards um, a concern. Um, if there's a blockage and there's jaundice, the bilirubin is going to be elevated. Uh, liver function tests uh, can be elevated. Um, the blood count may be low um, if there's bleeding associated with the tumor, uh, or there could be some elevation in tumor markers. And the ones we specifically look at for uh, these kinds of cancer are CA99 or CEA. Um, and and I, I just want to mention again, if anybody has any questions um, along the way, um, I, I, I want to keep this uh, informal and so feel free to, to um, uh, ask. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation. So let's talk about the biopsy. 
Um, the biopsy for most cancers is, is the gold standard. Um, without the biopsy, you can't say 100% uh, whether there's a cancer. But as I had mentioned, um, biopsies for, this types of, for these types of cancer can be difficult um, and um, are, are often um, not recommended because of the possibility of, of spreading cancer with the biopsy. And so oftentimes uh, a biopsy is obtained at, at the time of a surgery when uh, resection is attempted. Or, uh, attempted. Um, again, not usually recommended before surgery. What are the goals of treatment? Um, for, uh, for most cancers, the, the goal of treatment is, is of course cure. And cure of these particular cancers is, is and, and really any cancer is dependent on the stage. Um, and unfortunately, oftentimes these, these cancers can present at a later stage, and that's what makes these cancers uh, so difficult to treat um, because um, the really, when we're talking about cure for bile duct or gallbladder cancer, cure and surgery are synonymous. Um, without surgery, uh, there really is, is no chance of, of, of cure. And so early cancers are potentially curable. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that treatment cannot uh, offer significant benefit. Um, on top of that, depending on the stage, if, um, if the, the cancer is advanced and is, is not, um, not resectable or removable by surgery, then the goal may be palliation. And by palliation, what I mean is, is the goal is to improve quality of life. Um, that's to uh, treat symptoms, that's to uh, prolong life uh, for as long as possible. I did get what? a question in the chat that it was just asking, you know, you mentioned that if surgery isn't an option, then it's not curative. And so just, I guess, wanting to expand on that. Yeah, actually, we, we, uh, I, I'm going to go into surgery in a little bit more depth here in just a couple slides. And so we'll talk about that. I will keep that in mind. Um, so what doctors should I see for this disease? Uh, first off, it's important to, to maintain that, that ongoing relationship oh, with um, uh, your primary care doctor who's going to oversee your overall care. Uh, you may see a gastroenterologist, and, and the role of the gastroenterologist is to uh, perform endoscopy. And, and this may be a, 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 a time to be able to get a diagnosis and a biopsy and or uh, palliate some of the symptoms, uh, take care of the blockage. Um, and, and that may require drainage or, or a stent uh, or something that allows the bile to flow. You'll see a surgical oncologist to discuss surgery. You'll see a medical oncologist to discuss chemotherapy. And you may or may not talk about, uh, to a radiation oncologist to talk about radiation. Um, um, and, and really, it's, it's a multidisciplinary approach. It requires all the doctors to work together uh, to treat this disease. Um, so I, I talked a little bit about the stage of, of the tumor, and, and this will become important to answer that question about resectability and, and uh, potential cure. Early stage cancers are, are stage one or two. Those are typically confined to the bile duct or the gallbladder. Stage three cancers um, have spread to the lymph nodes or they invade nearby organs. Um, but they haven't necessarily spread uh, to, to distant uh, parts of the body or to other parts of the, the body. And then stage four is cancer that had spread to other parts of the body. And that means that the cancer uh, cells are, are no longer contained um, and uh, they're, they're acting on their own. Um, what are the treatment options? Um, first off, the, there's the possibility of, of the 
uh, again, the most common presentation is blockage of the bile duct and, and jaundice. And, and so oftentimes uh, at the beginning, before you talk about any other treatments, you have to, to make sure that the liver is working and it's draining. And, uh, and so the, the, um, uh, the, the blockage is usually taken care of either from inside the intestines so a scope will come in here like this, and then we'll go up through the bile duct. Um, and that's uh, done by a gastroenterologist. Um, or sometimes the two, there's a tube that comes from outside the liver and then comes into the bile duct to drain the, the bile duct that way. Um, and, it, and it really depends on, on the location of the tumor and, and how difficult it is to, to do endoscopically. Um, the other treatment options, Again, our surgery is systemic therapy and radiation. So, so let's get to um, uh, surgery. Will I need surgery and what will be done? Um, again, uh, surgery is, is the, the only potentially curative treatment. Uh, sometimes um, chemotherapy and or radiation is given before surgery um, in, in a situation where initially the tumor looks like it can't be completely removed or resected um, and it's given to shrink it down um, and, and convert it to a resectable tumor. Um, and then surgeries are based on, on location of the tumor, uh, whether it's, it's in the bile duct, the gallbladder uh, involving the liver or, or part of, uh, of uh, involving the pancreas. Um, uh, so, so let's, let's go back to this. Um, so at the beginning, the imaging is, is, uh, important to, uh, determine whether, uh, the cancer is invading into other structures, um, or there's evidence of, of spread to other parts of the body. And those are really the things that will determine whether, uh, something can be resected, um, and whether there would be a benefit. Um, if there is cancer that's spread to other parts of the body, then, then doing a surgery is not going to remove all of the cancer and, and, and it could potentially just delay the time uh, before chemotherapy could be started, which is going to uh, provide the most benefit at that point. So let's talk about what surgery would I, will I need and, and what will be done. Um, um, if the cancer is in the bile duct, um, here's, here's the anatomy again, uh, the, the liver, the bile ducts that are in the liver then come out. And so if the cancer is, is involving um, the bile duct that's outside of the liver, then you may just need uh, a portion of the bile duct removed. Um, and, and actually you would take the gallbladder at the same time. Um, when this is done, then the intestines are rerouted to connect to the bile duct and allow for drainage of the liver directly into the intestines. Um, if the tumor is too close to the liver, then sometimes you have to remove that bile duct plus a portion of the liver, uh, again, um, including the bile duct. And this is, is um, often the case when, because those, those tumors are too close to the liver, um, it's, it's, um, it's the, the, whether you need to remove a portion of the liver is dependent on whether you can get that, that cancer out with, um, with, uh, negative margins at that right next to the liver. Um, for a gallbladder tumor, you typically will shave a, a portion of the liver uh, so that it removes the gallbladder in its entirety. Um, oftentimes when the gallbladder comes out um, for uh, gallstones, you're still leaving a little bit of, of gallbladder behind. And for that reason, uh, sometimes even if cancer is found at the time of a surgery for, for what seems to be gallstones, uh, you may have to go back to surgery to remove uh, that portion of your liver and a portion of your bile duct. Um, and really uh, the bile duct is, is, is removed dependent on how far the cancer comes down uh, towards it from the gallbladder. 
Um, if the tumor is in the end of the bile duct, the distal bile duct, then this duct cannot be separated from the pancreas. And this is the pancreas right here. And the pancreas is an important organ uh, for uh, processing sugar and also for digesting food. So you have to remove, to remove this part of the bile duct, you have to remove a part of the, the pancreas, a part of the intestines, and a part of the, the uh, bile duct. And this is called a Whipple procedure. Um, uh, and and it's, it's removal of all the organs that I talked about. And, and actually you do remove the gallbladder too, and this doesn't show it, but you remove the very end of the stomach as well. And then the, the last type of op operation you may need is, is a liver resection uh, for what's called an intrahepatic uh, tumor or a tumor that's originating um, from the liver. What can I expect after surgery? Uh, for this, these type of, uh, type of operations, the typical hospital stay is about a week. Um, and that uh, can fluctuate depending on um, if there are any issues after surgery or, or how quickly um, you're able to eat after surgery. Um, usually, uh, your your uh, bowel begins to work again uh, three or four or five days after surgery. And so typically you have to wait until your intestines start to work before uh, you, you eat and you're supported uh, up until that point. Um, after um, uh, your week's stay in the hospital, typically you're at home recovering for about six weeks uh, before you really feel like you're, you're back to normal. Sometimes after surgery, um, quite often after, for these operations, uh, you will go home with, uh, or you, you will attempt, uh, initially have drainage tubes. You, you may or may not actually go home with them. Uh, oftentimes they are, are removed before you go home. Um, nutrition uh, ends up being a very important uh, part of recovery, especially since uh, sometimes uh, your, your appetite takes, um, a few weeks to, to really come back. And uh, you're also having to fast for those, uh, those first days after surgery until your intestines start to work. Um, for activity, really, um, after an operation uh, like this, uh, we like to have you up as soon as possible to um, uh, help with the recovery. Um, and uh, your, your activity really can resume over the next six to eight weeks to the point where you can start to exercise uh, six to eight weeks after surgery. Um, is there a way to speed up surgery uh, or recovery? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, I'm actually gonna start with the, the bottom two. So going into an operation, um, oftentimes it's difficult, but it's important to uh, maintain your nutrition. Um, it's also important to, to exercise when you can. Um, it's, it, if you can uh, preserve as much strength as possible, your recovery is gonna be that much better. Um, and then um, this, this is something that's, that's uh, been around for um, 20, 30 years, minimally invasive surgery. But really it's not until the last uh, five, 10 years where, where we've really pushed to do uh, minimally invasive surgery for major resections uh, involving the liver, the bile duct, or the pancreas. Um, at the City of Hope, um, we, we're really pushing uh, the, the envelope and uh, uh, pushing to do some of these, these big operations uh, where uh, you end up, before you would end up with a, an incision that goes from your, your uh, uh, chest bone all the way down below your belly button, um, and we replace that with several small incisions uh, that are about the width of a, of a thumb. Um, the, the benefit of, of robotic surgery is not just smaller incisions, as, as, as nice as that is, it's not the, the major reason to um, push for a surgery that um, while has benefits, does actually um, increase the length of the surgery. But, but by spending more time at the op during the operation, it ends up allowing for a quicker recovery, um, shorter hospital stay, 
and um, the ability to resume activity much sooner and, and uh, quicker recovery of bowel function. So, so you're not spending as many days uh, fasting. And um, there's also less blood loss during uh, these type of operations. Um, and, and so really you should ask your doctor to see if you're a candidate for a robotic surgery. Um, this is really dependent on where uh, the tumor might be, um, what the tumor is involving, and the extent of the operation. Uh, will I need chemotherapy? And the answer is, is in most circumstances for bile duct and gallbladder cancer that you will need chemotherapy. Um, this is usually given before or after surgery um, or when surgery is, is not possible. What are the side effects of, of chemotherapy? Um, the main side effects of chemotherapy uh, for um, the agents that you would get for, for um, this disease are nausea, immune suppression, which puts you at risk of infection, nerve toxicity, or, or what we call neuropathy, and that can cause uh, tingling and numbness in your, in your fingers and toes, and diarrhea. And uh, these, these are all managed by the, the medical oncologist and, and the doses and, and the treatment can be adjusted to minimize uh, the side effects. Um, so uh, before we talked about uh, the different treatment options and, and um, it really is, is put into category of, of the surgery, uh, what, what I called systemic therapy and then the radiation. And, and so systemic therapy includes chemotherapy. It includes something called immune, immunotherapy. And then it call, includes something called targeted therapy, which, which I'll mention later. So what is immunotherapy and is it right for me? Um, immunotherapy is something that has been developed over the last uh, 15, uh, 20 years, but, but really hasn't become an important part of treatment in, until the last uh, five years or so. Um, it was studied first with melanoma, uh, and we saw uh, significant uh, responses and, and people um, with incurable cancers all of a sudden becoming cured uh, because of treatment with immunotherapy. And so with that experience, we've pushed uh, towards um, uh, using immunotherapy in other types of cancer. For solid tumors, tumors and in, in organs like the liver, the, the bile duct, the gallbladder, um, the pancreas, um, the, the uh, immune response is, is not very robust. And immunotherapy really requires um, a, a robust uh, immune response uh, for it to be effective. There is um, a group of patients who um, will respond very well to immunotherapy uh, within gallbladder cancer. And uh, those are patients with something called microsatellite instability. And this is a test that's done on, on almost all cancers now, nowadays um, because of the, the possibility of, of such a great response. Um, it also can be given to patients with some, something called PDL1 expression. And so, so let me actually point this out here. Um, you know, you have a tumor cell, and the tumor cell has these, these um, uh, proteins that are on its surface. And those proteins are then presented to the immune cells or the T cells. The T cells uh, are, are the body's response to infection and to cancer cells. And, and actually, um, they're fighting uh, cancer um, uh, through all along. Um, and, and the reason we don't develop more cancers is because the immune system is, is keeping those uh, bad cells from proliferating and turning into uh, a, a major issue. But the cancer cells uh, present this other molecule, which then turns off the T cells. 
So if, if this protein is turning off the T cells, it won't mount a response to that cancer. So then we've come up with these um, drugs that can block this protein or this, this receptor. And then all of a sudden, um, the T cells come, come and attack the tumor cells and, and cause them uh, to die. Um, so there is a population of patients uh, that uh, will benefit uh, within bile duct cancers. And uh, so it's important to test for this microsatellite instability and the PDL1 expression. Uh, but there are other situations and uh, combinations of the immunotherapies with other uh, uh, therapies, whether it's chemotherapy or targeted therapy, that are showing some promising results. Um, some additional questions you might come up with uh, include how long will I be on chemotherapy? Uh, where will I get my treatment? What are the possible long-term side effects of, of chemotherapy? And, and uh, you know, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I'm a surgeon, and, and so, um, yeah, you know, I'll leave these questions up to, um, you know, a discussion you might have with a medical oncologist, but I think that they're important questions to ask, uh, and so I wanted to include them. And, and here's where I, I really want to emphasize. Um, for um, rare cancers, we're, we're really looking for uh, those subset of patients that, that have um, certain characteristics that allow for additional treatments than the treatments that we've, we've typically used in the past um, that, that have been so-so. Um, and uh, so what additional tests should be done? Um, I want to em emphasize something called next generation sequencing. Next generation sequencing is a, uh, a test where um, they take a sample of the tumor and they test it for mutations in the genes. Now, in one study, they found that 68% of tumors had some mutation that possibly is actionable or, or possibly can be targeted with some sort of therapy. Now, we already talked about microsatellite instability, and, and there are many reports that put, um, put it at about three, uh, so, somewhere between three and 10%, and it really de determ it is determined uh, by where the cancer is. Tumors that are in the liver or in the, the bile duct within the pancreas are more likely to have these, these um, uh, mutations than uh, of the um, other parts of the bile duct. There's also something called FGFR. Um, and this is a, a more recent, both FGFR and IDH1 and 2 are more recent discoveries um, and mutations found within bile duct cancer. And, and it's not an, an insignificant amount of, of the tumors that uh, have these mutations. Um, so this really uh, opens it up to uh, new types of, of targeted therapy or systemic therapy. And I'm not going to say these because, you know, there, it's just too many, too many letters. Um, it's it's uh, uh, letter soup. Um, but just, just to, to point out that there are um, lots of different uh, treatments. These are specifically targeted towards these mutations. Um, you know, one, one clue when you see these, when you see it ends in IB, then that's a clue that these are um, uh, antibodies that are developed to target a certain type of, of molecule within the, um, within the cancer cells. Another, um, another uh, a small group of patients may have something called an NTRK fusion gene. Um, and this is only a small percentage of patients, but there are medications uh, specifically targeting this, this type of, of uh, uh, mutation. Um, and then there are some other ones as well, uh, BRAF V600E, um, which in, uh, it accounts for about 5% of tumors, um, something called epidermal growth factor, uh, which um, for this, we're more looking for uh, mutations um, that, that make um, uh, 
th that prevent uh, this as an option. Um, and, and that accounts for about 30 to 40%. Uh, percent. So really in 60 to 70%, uh, there's an additional option. And then a small group of, of patients with something called HER2, which actually was discovered in, in breast cancer initially. And uh, we found this targeted therapy that works for this specific mutation. And it's now shown to be effective in many other cancers. And, and so we test it. So not that you have to remember all of this, but the, the main thing to take away from this slide is that you should ask your doctor to when, when there is a specimen, when there is a, a tumor that's been taken out or a biopsy that, that's been done, uh, you should ask for next generation sequencing um, because it, it can increase your options for treatment. Um, are there clinical trials available? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, there are many uh, clinical trials uh, that are available. At City of Hope, we have four. Um, some of them are phase one, some of them are phase two, and some of them are phase three. Many of them are first line. And, and what I mean by first line is it means um, you, you can get it uh, at the um, uh, diagnosis of the cancer um, before having gotten chemotherapy um, and uh, second line therapies are, are given after failure of the first line. And so these are given before get, giving any other chemotherapy or, or treatment. Um, phase one trials are, are early trials and uh, are usually uh, to um, determine the safety of, of a particular type of treatment. Um, and this particular trial is actually one that's, that's done by um, our interventional radiologists um, where um, this, this particular um, a treatment is injected into those tumors <clears throat> after uh, chemotherapy uh, has failed. Um, and for these other ones, uh, these are, are given um, to advanced uh, cancers. That means they're typically not resectable, uh, but they are given first line. Uh, that means, um, you know, wh whether you're, you're just diagnosed or you've gotten uh, treatment already, it is important to know uh, what, what clinical trials might be available. Um, the, as, as, we had, as I had mentioned before, um, I just wanna point out, here's this FGFR, this, this um, mutation that's in 10 to 16% of cancers. Um, there is a trial, a phase three, meaning it's already made it through phase one, it's already made it through phase two, and now it's on to phase three because it's, it's shown um, that it's safe and it's shown that there's some efficacy. And it's now a, a randomized trial to determine whether patients who get this uh, inhibitor of this mutation um, versus patients that, who don't um, uh, will respond. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned uh, uh, CAR T cells. I think I actually, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention this on the next slide. So what are the up and coming trials? Um, you know, we're always looking for the next uh, best thing, you know, that immunotherapy, that, that, that treatment that just changes, completely changes uh, the, the paradigm of, of treatment. And you may have heard of, of um, uh, something called CAR T cells. Um, City of Hope is, is actually an expert in CAR T cells. Um, and uh, while right now there are no CAR T cell trials specifically for bile duct cancer or gallbladder, there, there are, are constantly trials being developed. And in the future, um, there, there likely are to be CAR T cells that are targeted towards um, uh, bile duct uh, tumors. What CAR T cells are, it stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. Again, you have this T cell. The T cell is the cell in your body that's fighting off infection, that's fighting off um, uh, uh, cancer. And so you take a, a, a virus and that virus goes into the T cell 
it puts a new piece of, of DNA into that cell, which then expresses this receptor that's specifically targeted towards the protein on the tumor. And by creating this new receptor, the T cells can now attack those cancer cells. Um, recently, um, some of the, the researchers, and, and, and including Dr. Fong, who's part of the, the surgery department, um, have um, taken uh, both CAR T cells as well as something called oncolytic viruses. So the oncolytic viruses work the opposite way. They take the virus and they create these proteins. And then you take the CAR T cells that create the receptor and all of a sudden you have a new match. Um, and, and so there, there's, there's always things that are being developed um, that, that are potential treatments in the future. Um, hold on a second, my screen. Uh, oh, what factors determine whether the cancer will come back after surgery? Um, or what determines the prognosis? Um, this is based on tumor location. Certain tumor locations are, are at higher risk of, of coming back. Um, I do notice, uh, I, I see another question. After gallbladder surgery, do, do they usually have um, diarrhea? Um, that can happen um, after uh, any, any gallbladder surgery. It can happen after uh, any one of the operations that, that I talked about. Um, if, if part of the bile duct is removed, part of the pancre pancreas is removed. And part of that is, is due to the fact that, um, you know, that gallbladder is, is a storage tank of bile. And when you take away that storage tank, you rely on, on the liver to make enough bile to help digest foods. And if you're not digesting fatty foods, um, very well, uh, it, it can cause diarrhea. Uh, so, so back to what factors determine whether cancer will come back. Tumor location, uh, stage. Um, if the cancer is involving lymph nodes, um, surgery uh, still, still is, is uh, possible, uh, but it puts, it puts that tumor at higher risk of coming back. Um, also, whether the surgery was complete. If there are any cancer cells left behind, then uh, one, that may be an indication for radiation, uh, or two, it may uh, put, uh, put you at risk of having that tumor uh, come back. Um, it also would determine whether you get additional treatments uh, like chemotherapy. When the specimen is taken out and they look at it under the microscope, they look for invasion um, of nearby veins and nerves, and they also and, and also it's determined by um, the tumor marker. Um, and so I am uh, just about done, and and so uh, we should still have some time for more questions. How do I uh, stay healthy during treatment? This is an important part of 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 cancer treatment because it's been shown that. Uh, if you can stay healthy, if you exercise, if you maintain, uh, are able to maintain your weight and um, your, your ability to tolerate treatment is better and, and you will do better in the, in the long run. Um, sometimes this can be hard if you've had a major operation or you're getting chemotherapy that can cause you to be nauseated, but it's very important to uh, maintain your weight by, by increasing the lean types of protein in your diet. Um, and uh, so um, uh, we, we were talking about this earlier, um, you know, City of Hope uh, has, has over the last several years really expanded. And you can see um, it goes all the way out to Lancaster, to Thousand Oaks, to Temecula, to Palm Springs. And so there, there are many options uh, at the City of Hope. And really what we're trying to do, this is Pasadena. This is a, a South Pasadena where, where I practice uh, and in Arcadia. Um, and, and really the, the, the hope of, of City of Hope is, is that we can bring the treatment closer to home um, so that um, 
uh, hopefully everyone is, is able to get uh, the, the highest quality of care uh, wherever they are located. Um, and this is what we call the wishing tree at City of Hope. Um, it's, it's where people can uh, leave messages um, of, of their wishes or messages to family. Um, and uh, this, this is an actual tree. Um, and, and I will leave it up to uh, open to questions if anybody would like to ask. Well, thank you, Dr. Lewis. There are a number of questions that came in to me through the chat. Um, the first one was about a comment that you made, you know, when, when going through treatment, you mentioned that the immune system is suppressed. So someone's wondering about considerations given that there is a pandemic and that treatment will suppress the immune system. Any, any words sure, of advice that's, there? Sure, that's um, a great question and very timely. Um, you know, it, it often comes down to uh, balancing risks. When, when we, anytime we're doing treatments uh, for, for anything, it's, it's balance, balancing uh, benefits versus risks. And uh, so uh, at the City of Hope, we have continued uh, to provide treatment through uh, the pandemic. And uh, really we've been able to, uh, through, through uh, uh, protective uh, equipment, personal protective equipment, uh, through um, uh, different policies, we've been able to uh, keep um, uh, COVID-19 infections to a minimum among our patients. Uh, but it, it requires um, uh, that patients um, uh, isolate and, and, and protect themselves uh, during, during that as well. And now uh, we are uh, entering this phase of, of people getting vaccines. And uh, that's a common question is, is uh, you know, I'm getting, uh, I'm having surgery on this and this date, or I'm g getting chemotherapy, can I get a, a vaccine? And the answer is yes. Um, it's very important to, to get that vaccine, but it, it requires uh, uh, that you talk to your doctor and, and time it appropriately. Great. And another question was, you know, you mentioned some of the just early warning signs that, that may indicate disease, but you mentioned that usually the disease is more progressed once those early warning signs emerge. So somebody's just wondering, are there any other early warning signs to be aware of um, with gallbladder or bile duct mm -hmm. cancer? Um, you know, one thing I didn't mention is, is family history. So, um, you know, if, if you have a family history, it's, it's something to be aware of. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, really, um, it comes down to those, those signs and symptoms that, that we talked about. Uh, unfortunately, for these types of cancers, um, it's not like breast cancer or prostate cancer or colon cancer, where we have some sort of of tests that we can do uh, to um, uh, help diagnose uh, uh, a cancer or, or the, uh, catch something before you actually have the cancer and prevent the cancer. Um, th there's no screening tests. And, and so it, it really comes down to just knowing your body when there's something that's, that's unusual making sure to get uh, the appropriate tests, making sure to get the, the uh, images if, if you're having abdominal pain uh, and, it, and you don't think that it's normal. Uh, you, you, you need to request uh, from your doctor to, to get the appropriate scans or, or to get the laboratory studies that, that might hint uh, towards uh, early, early stages um, uh, of cancer. Another question was, are incidence rates equal across the lifespan or do bile duct and gallbladder cancers impact a certain age group more than another? Yes, um, so uh, they, they increase as you get older. Um, they're most common in uh, the, the fifth and uh, sixth decades, uh, but um, uh, as you get older, uh, your, your risk increases. Great. And then the last question that I see in the chat, and then people are welcome to unmute themselves, 
as well, but um, with a rare cancer, and I mean, I would imagine this is also compounded by isolation due to COVID. I'm wondering if there's a certain emotional toll that you recognize in your patients, given that it's such a rare cancer. Yes, you know, it's, it's definitely a difficult thing to, to deal with when, for, first off, just to hear that you have cancer. And then second, to hear that you have a cancer that's, that's um, uh, rare and, and uh, it, it largely, um, and, and there's, there's, there's many unknowns, um, you know, that, that definitely can, can have a toll. And then on top of that, COVID-19 can make it much more difficult um, when uh, you may feel that you're going through this all alone. Um, wh what I can say is, is that even um, in situations where, where family is, is not able to participate in some of the care, that um, at the City of Hope, the staff is, is very caring and, and tries to step in and, and feel, f fill some of those voids. Obviously, um, you know, things can be challenging with, with some of the restrictions that we have, but, but um, uh, where we can, we, we, we try and step in. Thank you. Those were all the questions that I saw in the chat, but I wanna invite if anybody has any more, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask them. Hello, Dr. Lewis. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I did see you mentioned that a high protein diet will help when receiving treatment. Um, and then you had touched earlier about how um, nutrition can play an important role. Is there, are there certain dietary habits or foods or, you know, um, macros or anything that will help, that generally help promote bile duct health? Uh, you mean uh, during treatment or, or just in general? In no, life? just in general, like prevention wise or anything. Is there, are there certain, you know, dietary things, especially for somebody like you mentioned, who may be more at risk because of genetic factors? Are there yeah. certain precautions that they should maybe uh -huh. lean more towards, or, you know, nutritionary tips for them? Uh, you know, again, it's a, it's a rare cancer, so it's it's um, it's hard to say. You know, there's certain foods that you should avoid, uh, but what what we do know is is for colon cancer, uh, for instance, that that red meat uh, actually can increase your risk of colon cancer, and so we could probably uh, extrapolate that to uh, cancers that that involve the other parts of the digestive system. Uh, I'm not sure that that. Um, you know, meat is, is or red meat is, is in particular is, is going to increase your uh, risk of, of colon cancer without, you know, it, it will also affect the pancreas, the stomach, the, 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 um, the bile duct, they're all part of, of digestion. So while we don't have any studies, um, you know, really it comes down to just, just um, moderation. Um, everything in moderation. And that's, that's uh, eating a well-balanced diet, um, that's uh, drinking alcohol in moderation while, while it's not associated with, with bile duct cancers or gallbladder cancers, it is associated with, with some liver cancers. Um, and, and also um, one of the risk factors uh, is, is potentially gallstones. Now, gallstones can happen um, uh, to anyone. Usually, if there's a risk factor associated with gallstones, it's, it's, it's untreated gallstones that, that cause inflammation over many, many years. Uh, but, but there is some um, association with, with uh, uh, fatty diets and, and, and gallstones. And, and so, you know, those, those um, uh, again, it really comes down to um, uh, eating a well-balanced diet, everything in moderation. Thank you. And then one more question came up on the chat. Um, somebody wondering why pancreatic cancer um, is on the rise. That's a good question. Um, some of pancreatic cancers are, are something called neuroendocrine tumors. Um, that's the type of pancreatic cancer that Steve Jobs had. Um, those are, uh, th there, there is likely something uh, either in our diet or, or in our environment that, that could potentially uh, be leading to those. But part of it is also um, we're, we're getting smarter and, and we're, able, it, we're doing more CT scans 
we're um, able to identify these these cancers that that uh, in the past we, we may not have, have even known people had. Um, and for the other ki kind of cancer, um, uh, the, the Patrick Swayze kind of, of pancreatic cancer, adenocarcinoma, um, the, uh, the incidence of, of, of this type of pancreatic cancer is, is oftentimes associated with, with um, uh, pancreatitis or, or chronic inflammation, uh, which, which can be associated with, with alcohol intake um, and, and dietary issues. Um, and, um, and, and also, uh, in, in general, um, uh, people are living longer. Uh, so as, as we live longer, we're detecting more of these cancers. Yeah, that context is so important that actually those diagnoses may indicate better diagnostic tools, as you said. And, you know, there's data this year that there are fewer cancer diagnoses, and that's not necessarily for a good reason. It's because people are delaying all those preventive screenings. So that context is so important. Um, I know we're at time, but there is just one final question, if, if you no wouldn't problem. mind. Um, some people just wondering, you know, you recommended a high protein diet when going through treatment. How much protein would you recommend? Um, it's, it's hard to give a quantity. Um, it's just that the, the reason for recommending high protein is, is because it has calories. And, and really, um, if you're not getting enough calories in, um, you, you're, you're losing weight, uh, you're getting weaker, your, your ability to tolerate treatment is, is, is harder. And, and so it's, it's really eat, eat get, get calories in, maintain the weight. And the easiest way to do that is, is with protein. And, uh, you know, sometimes the easiest protein to get is, is protein shakes. Um, it's an easy way to, to increase, quickly increase the, the calories in your diet. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lewis, especially for your generosity in answering all of these questions. It's so exciting also to hear about the immunotherapy options and the clinical trial options. It's just incredible. And I know City of Hope is at the forefront of all that. So thank you so much for your time tonight and thank you all for attending. Thank you for the opportunity to, to join you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Lewis. Have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Lewis.